Investment advisory services offered through Independent Solutions Wealth Management and Blackridge Asset Management LLC. Peak Broker Services LLC is not an affiliate of Independent Solutions or Financial Guys LLC. You're listening to The Financial Guys. We're $23 trillion in debt, honey. We don't have an extra surplus of money. Newsflash, guys. Stop attacking businesses because when all the businesses are gone, nobody's going to pay your salary anymore. You get that? If the goal is to create a loser mentality, well, you're winning. I'm going to build a right. big, beautiful wall with a big, beautiful door. Well, guess what? We have a big, beautiful door, all right? It's the wide <laughs> it's open about 90%. southern border, right? Yeah. Here's Glenn Wiggle and Mike Lomas. All right, welcome back, everybody. We've got the financial guys, Glenn Wiggle and Mike Lomas, although Tony Oliva is here for Mike Lomas. So if you're watching our YouTube channel, you would know that because Tony does not look like Mike Lomas. However, uh, Mike will be back here next week, and uh, this is a redo of the podcast, actually. So we are redoing this week's podcast. We, uh, we were out at the Club 45 meeting on Monday, as we said we would be, uh, to do our podcast. And uh, we did the best that we could there. They had a, a new venue. So where we did our podcast the last time there was over at uh, the Kennel Club. And I uh, had a great time at the Kennel Club. It was a, a wonderful facility there and worked out pretty well. Uh, nice big facility. However, they decided to make a change in where they're meeting. So we met over at a very nice room at the uh, Hilton uh, Airport. Right? Was it Hilton, was it? I think it was Hilton. Um, and I think they have a little bit of tweaking to do. So the room was great. The venue was great. Uh, music was crazy loud. So we tried to do a podcast from there as we did the uh, pr- uh, you know previously a few months earlier. And it was, uh, you know, really, uh, really difficult. So we'll play a little bit of sound of, of that and how that went in just a little bit, though. However, if you are t- new to our podcast, this is the, I guess, the podcast where money meets politics, although we usually say it's the radio show where money meets politics because we've been doing a radio show for 22 years. This is, uh, we have, is this our anniversary week or no? No, one more week. Next week will be our anniversary week when it comes to podcasting. We've been on the radio, Mike and I, for 22 years, uh, 20 years in the same station, WBEN, our flagship station, down here in South Florida on WFTL for the last several years. We've been on WJNO in the past, WKXNT in Vegas in the past. We are currently on uh, WAM 1180 in Rochester, uh, Buffalo, uh, BEN, and, of course, Florida again, uh, WFTL. Uh, podcast very different from radio, and we're going to do uh, kind of a next week a uh, side by side, so you can see where we were and how we uh, how we have progressed throughout the year. It's it's different in the fact that in radio you're taught that people can be tuning in, and and oftentimes are they're they're tuning away during a commercial, they're tuning back. People flip stations on the radio like they flip stations on TV, and so you're always reminding people you know, what you're talking about, who's on the air with you. We have so-and-so in studio. We were just talking about whatever. We are getting just getting back to blah, 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 blah. If you're just tuning in, you know, um, you don't do that on the podcast. So you'll find, I think, throughout the year as we've progressed, we've figured that out because oftentimes I'd get about halfway through a podcast and say, if you're just tuning in, I'd realize, well, Nobody starts a podcast in the middle of the podcast, right? That would just be stupid. So, of course, if you are already listening to the podcast, you would know exactly who we're talking to and what we're doing. So today we're going to do a redo of talking with Tony Oliva. Tony is a a Cuban-born American citizen, and he's been a friend of mine and a colleague for many, many years. And I wanted to get his perspective, you know, given the fact that all these socialists are running in the Democrat Party, you know, somebody who has fled uh, that kind of environment. Um, I thought the interview we did on Monday was absolutely fantastic, Tony. So thank you for for, uh, coming back uh, for a second go-around at it. Uh, The content was great. The sound quality, not so much. My pleasure coming back. It was rough there. Let me play a little clip of that sound clip real quick because I want people to understand what we were faced with and why we didn't use it because it just... uh Great venue again, but uh, here's what we were faced with uh, this past week at the Club 45 meeting. But I want to ask you about Tony. Gosh, this is so loud. This music is so, so loud. That basis. Anyway, it's like, honestly, I don't even know if this is going to work out at all. It's like it's getting louder and louder and louder. I might as well sing along. It's not going <laughs> to Anyway, we'll just we'll keep trying to plug through it, and this will be probably the worst, most noisiest, loudest podcast we've ever done. But uh. so obviously, we didn't want to use that audio, and, and so we I just we just couldn't. I mean, it was a great show. The the interview I thought was 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 great with you, Tony. I appreciate again your time. Uh, however, nobody would have heard anything. Nobody would have listened past like the first thirty seconds and be like, "Okay, next week, that's not going to fly." 
Um, so let's first rerun that back. Um, we had the opportunity while we were there to talk with the president, Joe Bud. We'll get him back on in the, in the next couple of weeks uh, or next couple of months as we're back out there again. But uh, but anyway, so um, let's let's kind of rerun back the, the interview we had uh, on Monday, Tony, and kind of go back your, your background. You know, much different today than it was certainly, you know, whatever, 40 years ago or, or 50 years ago when you first came to this country. Now they get mm. you know gift cards and freebies and, and all kinds of uh, handouts. It was a much different story when my grandparents came here on my mother's side in the uh, 19-teens. Uh, they had, our family had to vouch for them. They couldn't take welfare, and I'm sure your family faced a very similar uh, circumstance, correct? Yep. Um, actually, I want to thank you again for inviting me back because um, I truly, truly believe that this country is the greatest country in the world. And... We, as Cubans, the original Cubans that came in the late 50s and the early 60s, we didn't choose to come here. We honestly didn't want to come here, but there was a great orator, and his name was Fidel Castro, and he convinced the average Cuban that he was going to breed democracy, honestly, until they realized he was just a plain-out liar like we see with a lot of politicians, he turned out to be a full-fledged communist. So because of that, we had a difference in beliefs of our political differences. And our difference was where the Cuban people tend to be free-spirited, enterprising individuals, hard workers. And with that, the U.S. government allowed something there that was called political assignees. We were not and never have been immigrants. We didn't choose to be here, but due to politics. And if you didn't like Fidel Castro's politics, he would actually either kill you or he would lock you up in a prison. And I know my father was locked up in a prison because he refused to transport communist troops. So we were fortunate. We were sponsored by a aunt and uncle out of Miami that had already been living here. They were already American citizens. And that sponsorship basically stated, we didn't know until much later, that for one year, one year, the U.S. government would supply my parents with housing. Uh, what we call welfare or welfare food was back then. You just didn't go to Publix, which we have now. It would provide you with, let's say, military rationings. But after one year, if you didn't find employment, the person that sponsored you would be responsible for picking up the tab. So that motivated the original, original Cubans to find jobs. And a lot of them didn't find careers. They just found jobs. Whatever it was, they did not want to be a burden to their own family. So that was 1962, and I had no choice. I was three and a half years old. Wherever your parents go is where you go. <laughs> yeah, at that age, for sure. You know, it's interesting because, um, again, it's a much different scenario, but I think most immigrants even today – that have come here legally, you know, whether they have fled another country uh, and are here on asylum or they are, uh, you know, just gone through the process of, of uh, you know, getting a green card and getting employment and eventually getting a citizenship. Almost every one of them that I know, not everyone, but just about, those from Europe are a little iffy, but that's another story. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but, but most of them are, are very um, appreciative. They're hardworking. Um, they are proud. They don't want to be on, on, a, on a welfare or any sort of, of assistance. Those, however, are um, probably the minority of folks that are now coming into this country, sadly, because the majority are simply walking over the border. If you look at the whole of immigration, a lot of them are coming over the border illegally, not through the proper channels. And those folks are coming oftentimes for a much different opportunity. And for them, it's the opportunity to game the system. Oftentimes to, you know, to get on, you know, to, to take advantage of basically the welcome mat that the Democrat Party has put out there for them mm -hmm. uh, in the form of all kinds of, of, of benefits and whatnot. And we've really got to get to a, a back to a, a, obviously a border security. But I think we've got to fix our immigration system as well so that we can accelerate those that we want to bring to this country. Right. Mm -hmm. Those that are the enterprising entrepreneurs, uh, engineers, doctors, uh, business owners in general that are just looking for the opportunity to make a better life for themselves and their family uh, in, a, in a positive way and make a, a better life for uh, for our country, you know, to participate and to contribute in a positive way to, to this country and our society. When I see today, 
some of the rallies that you see in like LA and whatnot, and I see these folks carrying their home country flag. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at the same time, I see folks in places, you know, like uh, overseas in in, uh, in Hong Kong carrying the American flag, right? Um, it seems like it's completely backwards, and I don't understand how we got to this place, but, you know, I would never move to a foreign country and, you know, have a rally for our own country. I would just go back to my own country then if that's what I wanted, right? What are, you, what are your thoughts when you see stuff like that? I'll tell you, recently I've had some wonderful, wonderful experiences from Mexicans, actual educated, highly educated Mexicans. And I've been to the country of Mexico several times. They are, proudly the, are probably the proudest individuals of their country and their history and their flag and everything. And I was so happy with their pride while they're in Mexico. But if you're Mexican or from any other country, including Cuba, if you come to this country, I truly believe you need to become a North American North American is, I say that because there's South America, Central America, so I'm not going to say American. You need to become a North American. You need to become a USA American. You need to have pride in yourself. You need to have pride in your flag. And Listen, it actually starts in this country with something called the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America. And I don't think as little children we used to make that pledge, but if you just think about those words alone, you're pledging your allegiance to this country, to this country and only to this country. If you have so much belief that your country is better, if your education system is better, if your culture is better, if your land is better, if everything you think is better in your country, well, please pack up your bags and go back to your better country. If you're in this country, come here to become an American. My parents had to assimilate. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't understand all those terms. And I never understood as little children, there were four of us, where we would stay home and our parents would disappear at night. We never knew until much later that our parents were going to adult education schools to learn what's called American English. So later, years later, we understood did they master the language totally? Never, because they had to also work. Right. So the next day they had to get up and go to work, go to work, go to work. And then you brought up a good point. Your ancestors came from Europe. So you guys all had to register in Ellis Island. That's right. Off the coast of New York. Mm-hmm. I've been there, and there's names that go back 300 years. Well, all Cubans had to register in Miami, Florida. If you came to the United States, because a lot of Cubans to escape the tyranny, escape the Puerto Rico to Spain, even including Mexico to Venezuela. Mm -hmm. So there are Cubans still actually just scattered Scattered. all over the United States. So, but my my great great grandma um, on my mother's side never spoke English. Uh, She tried, but she was uh, a little bit older when they came to this country. So she never really um, was able to, to learn the language. And so my grandmother would be the translator. Of course, my grandmother was first generation born in this country and you know grew up bilingual, of course. And so my grandmother would be able to translate uh, when I had the opportunity to talk to my great-grandmother. Um, but because of that, she very rarely left the house. She did not want to go out into public in, without being able to, to speak English, which I totally understand. But you know, back then there was a, uh, like you said, there was a pride of being in America and being an American and wanting to, you know, desperately to be able to fit in and to, like you said, assimilate in a way that was almost seamless. You know, there was that, I don't want to be looked at as a burden or as a foreigner. I want to be looked at as a fellow American and I want to, you know, dress and speak and, and all that. And, um, and so as a result, she was never able to master that and she never left the house. My grandmother of course did and, and my grandfather and and so on. And, and, uh, and very interesting. Now, that's one side of the family. The other side of my family, interestingly enough, um, goes all the way back pre, uh, a pre-revolutionary uh, war. So my family actually comes to this country on my father's side uh, early in the 1600s and um, uh, or somewhere in the mid-1600s, early 1700s, somewhere in there. And uh, we have family that fought um, in the uh, Revolutionary War and the Civil War. So interesting you know, backgrounds when you look at it. But 
you know, I just, you know, today it just boggles my mind when I see folks like Bernie Sanders, of course, we just had the debate this week, um, you know, talking about their brand of socialism. You know, mm-hmm. uh, we had the opportunity to talk with you know, several Venezuelans and being down in South Florida, there's a lot of Venezuelans here. And, you know, they would tell you firsthand, you know, they elected Hugo Chavez. You know, he was elected the first time around with a lot of the same promises that Fidel Castro made, that Bernie Sanders is now making for this country. And I see that, you know, some of these polls that say, you know, 50 percent or whatever of millennials or 50 percent of of people under a certain age or 20 percent of the total population believe that socialism is the answer versus capitalism. I hear some of the politicians even say, well, socialism has been tried or or, or, uh, uh, capitalism has failed. It's been tried. It's failed. It's now time to try socialism. I think, well, well, socialism has been tried repeatedly, and it's the same results every single time. Uh, when you hear them talk about this is a different brand of socialism that Venezuela just didn't do it right, what are your thoughts? What do you what do you say? What do you want to say to people like that? Do you want to just smack them upside the head, or or or, or how do you take somebody who has that kind of belief and make them understand that? No, there is no different brand of socialism. It's the same result every time, yet people don't see it. It boggles my mind. This country was never built on socialism or communism. Uh, Glenn, as you mentioned, your ancestors, there's a good chance in Europe some of your ancestors were actually slaves. To whoever, to the king, to the king. So into the queens or whatever the case might be is. So your family, just like mine, left that country to make a better world. And we didn't come here to be controlled by governments. We left governments. So if you think about socialism or communism, it's all about government. And in true government, in the socialism or communism, it's actually not even a president. It's a dictator. So do we really want dictator Bernie Sanders? Well, that's what they'll say is, well, Venezuela is not socialist. That's a full-blown dictatorship. And I try to remind them, well, how do you think it started? Do you think that the people of Venezuela voted for a dictator? Or do you think they voted for a president who became a dictator? Well, I'll be honest. That's a straight answer. I truly, truly, truly believe the infection, the infection of communism that we have in all the Caribbean islands, South America, and Central America still comes all from one place— Communist Cuba. Mm-hmm. I'm, I don't know how people tend to not believe that the Chinese are not communists, tend to believe that the Russians are not communists. They're still infiltrated heavily in that one country. And Cuba is the one that spread the infection to the Venezuelan. And I asked my Venezuelan friends, how could you have let this happen with what you know about the other Cuban people? Yeah. Ridiculous. It is. And the sad thing is now the infection is spreading here. I go back to the word I said, great orators. John F. Kennedy was a great orator. And what made him great, he went to his writer, wrote all his speeches and says, write my speeches so a child in the sixth grade could understand it. And he did. He has some incredible, incredible speeches. And the one I always remember is the portion when he says, what can you do for your country? Mm -hmm. And this is our country. So the question to everyone out there is, What can you do to make this country better? And it's not more government because you're asking the government to make it better. No government has ever, ever, ever made one country better than it ever was. It's the people that make it better. That's absolutely right. That's what we preach all the time, as you know, Tony, that we're, you know, we are small government folks, Mike and I, we have been for our entire adult lives. And, you know, it's amazing to me, and we've had a lot of shows where we talked about this, is that. You know, people look at corporations as being, you know, evil and greedy, but you can divest your money from those corporations. You cannot buy their products. You can you can you can boycott the NFL if you don't like what they stand for or whatever. But you can't do that with government. Once you give the power to government, you are unfortunately subject to their their power. And you've got to be very, very careful of that. You know, um, you mentioned Cuba uh, and, and having the influence on Venezuela. And you're absolutely right. For those that don't know history. And we're not talking ancient history here. Please go back and study this stuff. Uh, Hugo Chavez was elected in 1998. Within two years, one year, he was visiting uh, Castro in Cuba, where he got all the ideas of, you know, the the, uh, uh, socialized medicine and taking over the oil and gas fields. He comes back to his country in 99, 2000, 
and immediately starts to employ now the Castro version of socialism, which really is communism, where the country begins to take over the oil fields under the same kind of rhetoric you hear today in this country, where it's, you know, we're going to return the resources that have been pillaged by large corporations, and we're going to return those resources to the people and, you know, uh, put the, the, you know, the money back in your hands. And it just never works, of course, because there's a government filter that handles that money. And of course, the government doesn't run things very efficiently, right? Because there's no thing called competition when it comes to government. So in the free market, what's so wonderful about free market economics is that if a company, is, you know, let's say there's a half dozen companies producing oil and gas, if one of those companies can no longer produce oil and gas because they're inefficient or they don't have the proper people or they're incompetent or whatever, well, guess what? They go out of business and somebody else, another company pops up to replace that company or the difference in business goes to the other five companies that are remaining. When you have the government taking over the oil fields, what happened almost immediately was a shortage of oil and gas, <laughs> believe it or not. It wasn't money going back to the people. It wasn't you know the, the, the profits flowing back to the poor. It was the profits flowing to the connected and the wealthy, and it was the oil stopping flowing, and the poor stayed poor, except the poor were got even poorer, and then also ran out of gasoline, and now out of food, and out of medicine, and, and out of so on and so mm -hmm. forth, which is a horrible scenario. You know, Florida, uh, before you get to the, the next uh, couple of things here, and I think I want to make sure we get touch on that, you know, the governor of Florida, uh, good for him, unlike the governor of New York, where I'm from, and sadly, uh, you know, going complete, you know, full-blown socialist slash communist in the state of New York. But in Florida, the uh, governor uh, DeSantis here uh, actually just mandated this past year that uh, to graduate high school, all students now have to take and pass a civics course. But I thought that was still mandatory across the country, but I guess not. It was when I was in school, but... Well, It'll be very similar, I guess, to the uh, to the naturalization uh, uh, citizenship test, which I think uh, is wonderful. I think I absolutely should. So good for I, him. Well, I was educated in the United States of America, so I will start there. When I came here, uh, my parents moved to a little small country town in Florida where all the little kids spoke English. And trust me, when you're a kid and you got no toys, you want to play with the kids that have toys. And honestly, that's how I mastered the English language because I wanted to play with kids that had toys. So today, everything I have, I've had to educate myself. I've earned everything I have. But you brought up Venezuela. And again, I'm going to tell you, Cuba is what infected Venezuela. Uh -huh. And in communism, in true communism, the first thing they do is they take over your media. They take over your newspapers. They take over your radio. They take over your television stations. Well, guess what? It's already happened here. We right now only have one radio station, or excuse me, one television station that has the courage, the courage to say the truth, what's really going on. It is sad. Mm -hmm. All media sends to repeat itself. It's almost, well, they're basically owned by two or three people, so they spread the news. So media was a problem. But you think about Cuba, the first thing they did is they confiscated all the guns. My parents, my grandfather, great-grandfather, all were hunters. They owned land. They took all their guns from them. So they could not protect themselves against the government. And then the last thing is, once they finally do that, they come after the banks. So imagine in the United States of America, where we trust our banks, if the government was to take over our banks, the government, again, think about dictatorships, they will be extremely, extremely multi, multi-billionaires, everybody in the top government. Yep. Fidel Castro died a multi-billionaire. Yep. His family has 80, 90, 100-foot yachts. Yep. And the poor people of Cuba, I've actually talked to family that's come from there, they actually make ground beef out of banana leaves because there is no beef to eat. Right. It's amazing that the Cuban folks have endured for so long, but when you take away the guns, there's nothing you can do, right? Venezuela followed the exact same path, right? They started to nationalize major industries, uh, as I mentioned, uh, healthcare, education, uh, uh, oil and gas, and so on. The banks, eventually they took over. Um, and eventually, in, in the uh, not, not, not ancient history, again, in about 2011, uh, they confiscated the guns. And once they confiscated the guns, it was full-blown, you know, communism at that point, and, and the poor got poor. And that's when things really got ugly. The sad part, again, is that you have folks that are just a complete denial, right? The folks that say, well, Venezuela didn't collapse because of the socialism. Venezuela collapsed because of the oil and gas prices that collapsed. Well, then how do you explain all the other socialism experiments that have collapsed? 
How do you explain the Russian collapse? How do you explain all these other places that have tried socialism and are running away from it as fast as possible after it has failed? And it just amazes me in this country that we have dumbed down the populace to such a point that anybody in this country would think that communism or socialism is a good thing. And when you hear these folks, you know, uh, this past week, uh, again, James O'Keefe, a great uh, job, another a great hit piece on uh, uh, Bernie Sanders' uh, campaign staffers. And I've heard some of the media dismiss it to say, wow, those are just low-level campaign staffers. Really? The fact that we have anybody in this country with that kind of mentality that if, you know, he said that if he didn't see the videos released, uh, uh, I think, yesterday, um, you know, the campaign staffers saying if Bernie doesn't get the nomination in Milwaukee at the conference, you know, the city's going to burn and we're going to target police officers and, you know, we need to, we need to re, you know, bring back the gulags, which weren't that bad, so that we can have re-education of the Trump supporters because – Apparently, you know, wanting, you know, equality and, and, uh, and, a, and a better economy for, you know, all races and, and, uh, and religions is, a, is a, uh, apparently a, a horrible thing. You know, wanting a, 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 a rising tide that's lifting all boats <laughs> apparently is a, is a horrible thing to some of these folks and people need to be educated. It's, a, it's amazing to see that anybody in this country has that mentality at all. But unfortunately, we know we do. Uh, not, how much time we have in the camp? We've got to wrap this up. Okay, we've got to wrap this up. We got a few minutes left here, Tony. Uh, anything that I missed that you maybe want to mention? I was going to get to some of these clips uh, from the debate this week. Of, of Warren uh, uh, and Biden had a great clip, uh, hilarious actually. If you look at it, Warren just one, two, three decades. We'll play that on the radio show this this weekend. Uh, Biden on North Korea. You know, outside of the fact that he you know kills people, he's not a bad guy according to uh, Kim Jong uh, Il, according to, uh, to to Joe Biden. But we'll save those clips for our Saturday radio show. Don't forget to tune in Saturday on WBEN. And uh, Wham 1180 in Rochester. Or you can, of course, listen to us on iHeartRadio. We are live from 1 to 3, and we'll take your calls and questions there. Tony, anything I missed that you want to mention before we yep. go? I, I will say this really quickly. Um, in education in the United States of America, I had to graduate from high school, and we mandatorily had to take a class called Americanism versus Communism. I aced the class. I loved the class. My father raised me since three and a half years old to be anti-communist, and I will die anti-communist. With that... I'm saying is the people that are in this country are fortunate. They're born American citizens. I had to apply. They did a background check on me. You had to sit in front of a person that questioned you and your beliefs. And one of them is if we ever go to war against Cuba, what would you do? I said, I am full support of going against Cuba right now to alleviate that country of communism. But... Right now, what I am seeing, it is sad, it's pitiful, is homegrown communism yep. from young children that are being lied by these orators. I just heard the stupidest thing is, when, how can you wipe out all the student debt? Mm -hmm. You can't wipe that out. That means the taxpayers would end up having to pay for all that. Yep. There'll never be another student loan ever, ever, ever if you rip off the companies that let those people borrow money. So I say that every person living in the United States of America born here should have to take a test at the age of 18 to stay an American citizen. And if you don't pass the test, we revoke your American citizenship that you were born for. Understand the difference between me and American citizen? Mm -hmm. My citizenship can be revoked at any time. Well, and they would deport my ass back to communist Cuba. If, if they asked people the questions of who you support, there'd be a lot of folks like Colin Kaepernick that would be kicked out of the country. Because if you asked him that question on who do you support, Cuba or America, folks like Bernie Sanders would say, well, they got a better health care system. So I don't know. It'd be a tough call. Anyway, all right, folks, that's going to do it for us. Thanks for listening. We do appreciate it. If you're watching on yep. YouTube, appreciate that as well. Hit the thumbs up button below. We do appreciate it. helps out a lot. Also, uh, or hit the bell right on YouTube. Yeah, hit the bell. Subscribe so you'll get the notifications when we release all the new podcasts, which we typically do each week on Wednesdays. Don't forget to tune into our radio shows, both in South Florida on WFTL, uh, News Talk 850, as well as New York on News Radio WBEN and Wham 1180 in Rochester. So, again, on behalf of Mike Lomas, thank you to Tony Oliva. I'm Glenn Wiggle with the Financial Guys, and we will talk to you on Saturday on the Financial Guys radio program. Thanks for listening.